Well, hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me here today. I wanted to talk about this recent NASA press conference where Bill Nelson, the head of NASA, uh, was talking about this new UFO UAP research committee that they're forming. And they had, you know, some presentations from each of these members. They hadn't chosen the new head of research yet. I think his name is Mark Erninery or something like that. Um, and then they denied who the head of research would be, interestingly enough, because they said that the colleagues of these people had started to threaten them with, you know, stigma and it could be bad for your career type of stuff that we've heard in the past associated with this topic, which is interesting enough in and of itself. But the main gist of this uh, press conference about two weeks ago is Bill Nelson basically and the others said, we don't have any evidence that any of this uh, anomalous uh, sightings, uh, which they didn't mention specifically what they were talking about. We don't have any evidence that any of this is extraterrestrial or anomalous. And I think that's a highly problematic statement to make because I've dealt with uh, at least five people that have worked with NASA since the mid nineties, uh, who have told me that there's a definite, uh, there's definite evidence for extraterrestrial sightings, activity, photographs, and so forth. And I just wanted to mention some of these, uh, to you, because I think if NASA wants to have, you know, this transparency that they keep talking about, they need to deal with their own employees their own astronauts who claim to have been witnesses to these phenomena who say it's definitively anomalous. They know for sure that it was, and it requires further investigation rather than just say, well, we don't have any evidence. I mean, if you just look in the last two weeks, maybe they don't have any evidence, but you know, it's incumbent upon NASA to do a historical review of their own witnesses and evidence. And here are just some of them that I've encountered uh, in the course of you know, looking into topics like this. Uh, it starts out with remote viewing. When I was learning remote viewing at Farsight Institute in 1996, uh, there were two people who came to classes there, uh, once I was an instructor, who I got a chance to talk to. Uh, one of them was a civilian astronaut who had trained to fly on the shuttle. He actually hadn't been on the shuttle, but he showed me pictures of himself uh, at, you know, uh, different NASA facilities in his uh, astronaut suit and he had been trained to fly on the shuttle and in the course of his training he said he came across evidence about triangular craft um, and how these were used by the US military and that they were actually and this is quite a shock to hear this at the time these were reverse engineered extraterrestrial craft and uh, I mean, he didn't provide proof of that, but here was someone that had been an astronaut, had been in the astronaut training program. Uh, he was just coming to learn what remote viewing was all about since it had been declassified uh, just a year before, uh, talking about some sort of knowledge of extraterrestrials from his uh, work as an astronaut. And those were the black triangular craft. Uh, he uh, didn't refer to them as TR-3Bs, but they were similar to that, and he said that, you know, uh, this was something that was familiar to him. Uh, another person was a f film expert who had invented a machine to transfer 16 millimeter film, which, you know, we used to use back in those days in the 70s and before, uh, to video. And his job, he had been hired by NASA to transfer all of their 16 millimeter film footage to video. And uh, he said very clearly, you can see in this film footage, which hadn't been shown to the public, uh, buildings, structures, domes, glass domes, things that seemed like very old that had been broken. Uh, and, and he was uh, completely certain that this was prior civilizations to humans having inhabited the moon, maybe uh, fighting with each other. Uh, but he said he could clearly see these types of structures. But what I really wanted to talk to you about was Dr. Richard Hoover. I've done some videos on Dr. Hoover before. Dr. Richard Hoover was someone I met at the UFO Congress in 2014. Uh, 
an extremophile expert. Extremophiles are organisms that can live deep below the ocean and volcanic vents way down at the bottom of the ocean, you know, organisms that can live in extreme environments. And they might live in extreme cold, like in the Arctic or extreme radiation, you know, nuclear power plants. And uh, Dr. Hoover was someone that I wrote about in Black Swan Ghosts. Here's the new cover. It's a one version of the new cover that we're working on here. Uh, this is a book I published, when was this, 20, 2017. So it's just about six years old at this point. And this is what it used to look like. And, you know, this was the Amazon cover with their cover designer, but I wanted to make it look better. We're going to come out with a revised edition at some point. And I talked about Richard Hoover. I made videos about him. He worked for NASA as an astrobiologist. And he described to me... Um, how much blowback he got from even wanting to talk about finding fossils of single cell organisms and diatoms and very simple organisms in carbonaceous meteorites that are recovered on Earth. He said if you crack them open, you would find fossils of these tiny organisms that had come from outer space. So technically, these were extraterrestrial fossils. And he told me if you uh, found these in rocks on Earth, you'd have no doubt that these were fossils. Uh, they looked exactly the same. So, uh, but the thing is, he got a lot of blowback from NASA, and he uh, he eventually inquired who was uh, telling NASA to stop him from talking about this, because they asked Richard not to go to conferences and say that he had found fossils and carbonaceous meteorites. And, and Richard is someone with... Uh, 300 peer-reviewed conference proceeding, proceedings and papers. 300 peer-reviewed papers. Now, I have a few myself, but 300, that's a lot. Uh, I think something like 29 books and about 30 international and U.S. patents. He's a highly qualified person, person one of the top astrobiologists on the planet. And they told him, when he asked why they didn't want him talking about extraterrestrial fossils and, and just simple life forms. We're not talking about ETs and humanoids. We're just talking about very simple life forms, fossils. Uh, also evidence that he felt was on Mars of water, or snow, and things, pictures he showed us at the poles. But what was the source of the uh, antagonism to his message? He was told... And I'm reading you, this is, he, he edited his chapter very quite carefully to make sure I got it right. Uh, he said his supervisor informed him that officials in the White House were worried that a report on extraterrestrial life might be offensive to some of the fundamentalist churches and possibly other religions. And he told me this came from the Obama White House. So it was as if the political consequences of talking about this were leading NASA to say we don't want to have a discussion about it. Again, I think something that the current UFO UAP research group in NASA needs to take a look at. It's not just peer-reviewed scientific papers. Now, NASA needs to look at their own witnesses, their own employees, the astronauts, the scientists that have worked from them, who have uh, worked for them, who've, who've told us that there is evidence for extraterrestrial uh, life. But the main incident here that really blew my mind was his discussion of Skylab. Uh, he said that there was a cover-up of that 1973 Skylab incident where uh, an astronaut saw an object that looked symmetrical and looks like it has a tail and a kind of a frontal section, like a Klingon bird of prey or something from Star Trek. I'm going to read this to you because it's so astounding. Hoover told me that he was on the communication console at NASA Johnson Space Center in 1973 when Skylab astronaut Owen Garrett reported to the CAPCOM, the capsule commander or person designated by NASA to talk with astronauts, that they were observing red lights outside the Skylab wardroom window they were taking photos of the object that appeared to be in orbit with Skylab. After the mission, Owen discussed the event at a press conference and said NASA would know more after analyzing the photos and the radar data. 
it was thought the images would be made public after the film was developed. But he never saw them. So seven years, several years later, Richard phoned his friend, Noel Lamar, the NASA JSC Photo Lab director, at a colleague's request to request a copy of the red light photos. As the director was out of his office, another friend answered the phone, the lab worker who had closely worked with Hoover, while they selected the films that would be flown on Skylab uh, S-56 X-ray telescope. The lab assistant described the red light photos to Hoover, gave him the image frame numbers, and told the person's name at NASA MSCF, who had the prints of these images. Just then, Noel returned, and the lab assistant transferred the call to him. When Richard asked the director for copies of the photos, there was long silence on the other end of the phone line. The director then told him the pictures did not come out. He said it all had been a mistake. The red lights were just a reflection of panel lights, red panel lights inside Skylab. The lens had been pressed against the window, so the light did not reflect back into the camera, and there was nothing on the outside of Skylab. So it already doesn't make sense. There's nothing, then there's something, and it's reflections, but they can't reflect because, you know, those windows are not huge on spaceships, Skylab. And uh, if you're pressed to Hasselblad, big lens, how is it going to reflect? Like and reflect if you're pressed against the window. It's going to cover the whole window. In any case, he asked Noel how that was. Uh, Hoover was astonished. It contradicted all he'd just been told by the lab assistant. He uh, asked Noel how it was possible since the camera was an SL, SLR. And Owen never would have wasted precious film if nothing was there when he looked into the viewfinder. He then asked the director how NORAD could have tracked these lights on radar if they were merely reflections in the window. The director said that he had heard nothing about radar tracking, and uh, it said NORAD tracked them too, and asked why Hoover thought that had occurred. And when Hoover told him, it was, it was discussed on the open comm loops in real time. Hoover was told his memory must be mistaken. <laughs> it never happened, you see. The conversation end, ended with Hoover being amazed by the curious, discordant conversations with uh, the two friends he trusted and believed were to be completely honest and trustworthy. And Hoover and his colleagues went to see the images at the office of the MSFC official who had a book containing all Skylab photos from this particular camera, the Hasselblad. And then they discovered the photos with the frame numbers of the red light images were missing from the book. That particular sequence of shots was simply absent. A few years later, Richard was at a science conference in Boulder, Colorado, when he stopped in at a bookstore. He found a book called UFOs, Past, Present, and Future, based on the documentary of the same name, produced by Robert Emenegger and Alan Sandler at the request of the U.S. Air Force in the mid-70s. This is a very interesting movie. Uh, this book is based on the movie that came out uh, in the 70s at the request of the U.S. Air Force, a U.S. Air Force-funded UFO movie. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. The original name was UFOs. It has begun, hosted by Rod Serling. And uh, it uh, is a great movie if you ever get a chance to look at it. it. They had a book form of it. It has all sorts of interesting cases, including that Colonel Coin case where the helicopter was pulled up in the 70s, National Guard helicopter by an object emitting a green light, and they gained thousands of feet of altitude. And the Childs, uh, was it Childs Witted? A uh, plane case in the DC-3 in the south, I think that was in the 50s or so, and it had a very close-up sighting, and many other good cases. But it's, it's a serious UFO documentary funded by NASA, funded by the U.S. Air Force. It's filmed in the Pentagon with Pentagon officials, Colonel Robert O. Friend and others, talking about this seriously. That was back in the 70s. Uh, how we can go from this current time period where we're told by arrow and this nasa uh committee that there's just no evidence for anything extraterrestrial and yet the u.s air force was saying just the opposite in the 70s right after project blue book close uh also the the, the air force projects go back to project sign in 1948 and project sign alone had 60 cases they said were unexplainable by any conventional means so you have this whole uh, decades of research by the U.S. Air Force, and NASA doesn't seem to want to look at that. But here he finds the book, 
and then it's an honest look at the UFO phenomenon. And uh, uh, now, we're right before this is supposed to be published as a movie, the Air Force changes their mind about. I'm t I was told or heard from. I think it was Grant Cameron who gave a presentation about this at the one of the UFO conferences, UFO crash conference, or another one. Uh, it was going to be distributed in movie theaters, and then the Air Force changes their mind. But the movie is finished, and you can still see it on YouTube. Leafing through this book, Richard was stunned to see the very photographs he was told didn't exist, complete with unexplained luminous objects photographed by Skylab astronauts uh, Owen Garriott and Al Bean. So uh, this is right here in this book. You have these very pictures. Uh, there's a color section in the middle here. And strange objects photographed by NASA missions over the years. These are pretty weird looking, huh? Shot during Gemini 11 flight. The 18th revolution, 1966. Unidentified as determined by NASA photo evaluation laboratory. But here is the one that Richard was talking about. And he was told by the director at the photo lab that the pictures didn't come out. And then they're missing from the book of Skylab pictures taken by that camera. And yet here they are a year later in a book published in 1974. Very interesting looking object tracked by NORAD radar. So here we have just one case of NASA scientists, NASA astronauts photographing an anomalous object that to this day has never been explained and we can see even at the time that it happened there was a cover-up and this is what I think NASA needs to address if they want to be taken seriously about their investigation into this issue which is their own evidence from their own Skylab and Apollo missions and other uh, space projects where weird looking things are photographed and there's no explanation for what they might be. And then people that inquire about it are given a runaround. So this is quite a serious issue, and I think NASA needs to address this. There's another aspect to this, uh, which is crash debris. And even in, uh, by the way, this cover was done by the same, uh, this cover done by the same person who did, Mark Tuckman, who did Dark Matter Monsters, yay. I thought he did a good job with Dark Matter Monsters, so this is why he redesigned this cover here. In Chapter 19, I have someone named Phil from Colorado who told me while he was working at, and, and he worked, he's worked for JPL and Ball Aerospace and other aerospace contractors, and he was working for one of these contractors when he said that uh, they were given material from JPL, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, to they were told the people who made it left could did Phil's team figure out how it worked and he, Phil told me with no uncertain terms this was not human technology way too advanced uh, way too small uh, they could never figure out how it worked it was electronics having to do with fiber optics and he said it just was a generations past where our fiber optics is at and he was 100% certain that this had to be extraterrestrial. And he said the whole team thought the same thing. So it's another example, Just and these are just people I've met and talked to personally, uh, of a witness from an aerospace contractor given materials from NASA and asked, how does it work? Uh, and they can't figure out and come to the conclusion that it's extraterrestrial. We've heard this uh, time and time again now, but this is just something else out of NASA that has to be addressed. So I think if NASA wants to be taken seriously, they need to address these types of witnesses. Other people I've talked to included Edgar Mitchell, the sixth person to walk on the moon. Edgar told us at a conference in Fort Collins uh, in the late 90s that he hadn't seen anything extraterrestrial on his Apollo mission, but he had spoken to other astronauts who had, uh, he said, many astronauts. And he said they all said the same thing, that they had seen evidence of this during their flights to the moon and back. And so you need to deal with people like Edgar Mitchell, uh, 
Gordon Cooper, uh, Jim McDivitt, others who, uh, Story Musgrave, other people who've worked within NASA who claim that they've seen this type of evidence. Uh, I think it's important that NASA address this because why would you have all these credible astronauts and research scientists and aerospace engineers saying things like that uh, for no particular personal benefit to themselves, uh, to people like me and at conferences. And then NASA comes forward just a couple weeks ago and says, well, we don't have any evidence of anything anomalous. And you have all these people who say they've heard this. Uh, the final case I'll mention here is author Timothy Good, uh, a musician and a author of many UFO books, had one book called uh, Above Top Secret. It was one of the first books I ever read that got me going off in this direction, published in the 80s, about UFOs. But he came up with a more recent book called Earth and Alien Enterprise, and he recounts being told a story by someone that worked in the UK's MI6 intelligence office, a woman, Pamela H., who had told him that she had been uh, at a NASA conference in Spain and she could hear Neil Armstrong talking in the next room over in the hotel through one of those doors that connects hotel rooms. And he was telling somebody that he had seen uh, extraterrestrial craft on the moon uh, at one of the edge of one of the craters. And as Pamela had said, he, he kept saying, boy, were they really big and they were somewhat frightened, they called back to NASA for, you know, asked them what to do. And she went, later on, she saw Neil at the conference, she confronted him about this. And he, all he would say is, I can't, I can't talk about it. So, uh, so we do have this type of evidence, and I think it, it's incumbent upon NASA to address their own astronauts, their own uh, scientists' testimony, especially people that have quit over this contentious type of issue. It's not just the stigma that NASA's talking about now forming a UFO, UAP research group from the colleagues of people that are serving on that research group. It's the own, their own uh, attempt to silence and stigmatize their own witnesses from within NASA. I think they need to come clean about this. I mean, Congress is doing it right now through, uh, we have had some public testimony, David Grush and others, the F-18 pilots, uh, Ryan Graves and Dave Fravor, but uh, most of it's been classified. It's been behind closed doors in you know in skiffs, so that these witnesses can share this classified information with members of Congress. I mean, Congress has been hearing this for years. NASA needs to have some type of process like this too. We just can't take their statements on the face of it. We need to see that they've been talking to their own witnesses. So anyway, okay, that's what I think about NASA's uh, UAP UFO committee. Uh, I'm interested always to hear your opinions, put your comments in the box below. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video. Take care for now and bye.